Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, thanks for the invitation first, um, again, uh, to be able to speak here. It's it's an honor. I also see some some interesting people um, I've been in contact with, and I would like to, to contact again very soon. Um, today, um, we would like to have a slightly different session than what I am at least used to. Um, we will not have a webinar where we just uh, tell you for about 30 to 60 minutes um, what we're doing or what we see, um, but we will try to do it in a, in a way that we'll all have a um, give a short pitch and then um, discuss about the topic of the future of biochar with regards to markets as well as uh, industry setups and their scaling. So today um, I will be giving a introduction to the European biochar market as you, as most of you or some of you might know, we have um, uh, submit, well, created a market report on the European biochar market. So that will be the introduction. Then we have uh, Willy Steiner, the CEO of Carbon Standards International and the owner of the EVC and the EBC Sync, of course, which is linked to that. And then we'll have Berta Moya from Carbon Future, um, who will giving us who will be giving us a um, well the traders' view on the carbon markets based on biochar. And then Marcel Huber, CEO of Syncraft, who will be talking about the um, well options and challenges uh, in scaling so rapidly as the industry is right now from an um, a systems provider's perspective. So to my presentation, I will start not talking about biochar because this is something you all know, but about the um, pyrogenic carbon capture and storage. As you know, if we do pyrolysis, we have different uh, revenue streams and products. So one main product is the biochar, um, the physical carbon, and the other is the climate service that we're providing if we are using the product biochar in a carbon conserving way. So um, we're now well, using the, the term pyrogenic carbon capture and storage um, for this climate service, for the storage of, of carbon, because uh, it seems to make sense. People seem to, to put it into the right uh, box, if you want so. Um, and this is if you, well, the process is that plants capture CO2, they transform it um, into, into their biomass, and we transform it into stable carbon through the process of pyrolysis. And then by the use, if you have a carbon conserving use, it is uh, stored. So that's this, the S in the in PICS. Um, of course, you need carbon conserving uses. The most common one is agriculture. Um, a very interesting one emerging now globally or scaling globally are urban applications. Um, quite well known how to do it. I think you've shown that in webinars before. Um, and in construction. Of course, there are also different types of uses, but those are those the three main pillars we see for rapid scaling in the near future. We, that's uh, our members, who are actually developing those uh, the systems and also, also the, the use cases and the different products or pre-products, um, we're happy because well, that's basically the industry. Um, but we start with um, manufacturing equipment. Of course, you need biomass. That's the first thing. Uh, the second step would be manufacturing equipment. And that uh, by now is at a technology readiness level um, where we can just buy a, a system and install it and, and produce biochar and, uh, and further products. So here are a couple of examples for system providers who have really installed a large amount of systems. Um, some of uh, some larger systems, we have different sizes, we have different use cases, um, different input materials uh, that, can, that can go into those systems and different types of pyrolytic processes um, they are using. So there's, something that fits basically all, all needs. Uh, also for special uh, specialized uh, treatment of, of certain types of um, residue fractions, for example, sewage sludge in, in this case. So now to the market, um, we have, basically we still have the, the biomass that can be provided. 
Um, we have the production equipment um, and we have the sinks also. We were talking about that, but I have two people who are more competent uh, in, in this regard. So I will uh, let them be, do the talking. Um, now to the biochar market. We have uh, done give, well, presented a market analysis last year and this year we have a new one. So um, last year we had 25 production facilities installed. Um, and um, therewith, we are over 100 installations in Europe, and uh, the tendency is that they are getting bigger. So most of them were producing over 200 tons, but uh, some of them considerably more. Now, this year, what we're expecting is 44 um, facilities that will be um, installed this year. Um, um, in the next year, of course, this trend will, will continue. And so I seem to be clicking the, the wrong buttons all the time. Um, and therewith, we are at, uh, at growth rates of last year, 71%. So we reached over 70%, which how we expected it to be. And this year will be um, most likely 85 or over 85% of uh, KGAR. So we, are want, we want to be looking at actual numbers and not only at um, production potential. And uh, with regards to that, we have um, a production, an actual production in 22 of almost 40,000 tons of carbon, of um, biochar, which is equivalent to about 100,000 tons of CO2 equivalent, which makes biochar the most important negative emissions technology, industrial one, um, in Europe at the moment. And this is how we go and advocate for biochar on the European level. So if we're talking about biochar, it is EBC grade biochar. And how you can um, how you can see here, um, it is uh, the, the darkish, darker brown um, fraction of the total production is EBC certified. Um, it was 50%, about half of the production in 2018. And uh, this year it will be about 70%. So EBC is gaining importance, um, not only because people want certified material and products, but also because EBC is linked to EBC sync and the sync certification is becoming more and more important. So how will we be scaling to climate relevance? Um, this is an important issue for all of us. Um, if we look at the growth we have at the moment, it's 85%. And if we continue that growth a bit more conservatively, estimating 80%, uh, <clears throat> we will be uh, at a megaton um, of, of production in Europe in 2026, so in, in four more years only. Um, by 2030, we can reach 10 megatons of, uh, of carbon removal or CO2 equivalents. And by 2034, we could reach 100 megatons. So I wouldn't say the gigaton is within reach, but globally, certainly it is if, um, if other regions would continue in the same way. So that would mean um, uh, a steady growth of 80%, a little less than we're having this year for uh, until 2034. So that is our aim, and this is how we'll uh, close for now and hand over to the next presenters. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Howard. So Julie Steiner from Carbon Standards International is the next presentation. Okay, thanks, uh, Christian. Um, Thanks for the invitation today. It's a, it's a big honor for me to be here uh, and to um, give you some additional information about uh, the trends in the market and um, how we see the biochar market at the moment as Carbon Standards International and also from the point of view of the EBC uh, standard. I decided to uh, present you today three main learnings or three trends that we see 
at the moment in the market um, and uh, uh, we can discuss it afterwards in the in the panel discussion um, I would like to start with uh, with the first trend that we see um, it's the trend for the production of high quality biochar that's um, that's what we see because more and more the um, application of the biochar gets gets more and more important also for for the producers for for uh, farmers um, uh, and uh, for uh, constructing companies I would, I would like to come back in the point three then uh, to this uh, trend that we see and for that i think the ebc standard version 10.1 that we have at the moment uh, in the portfolio is is a good uh, method it's it's a good instrument for producing really a uh, high quality biochar um, and this product um, can be used then in different um, industries or uh, on the farm level uh, whenever uh, wherever the the biochar is used the second trend um, that we see and uh, it's really positive in my point of view is that we have more and more scientific papers now um, that we have from, from the research side who shows that, as example, the application of biochar uh, on the farm level um, it don't depends if it's applied as example in compost or it's applied on the, on, the, on the level of animals as feed uh, is, is really positive, has a positive uh, impact on on the farm on the economic efficiency at the end of the uh, also has a positive um, impact on the on the humus content of the soil and organic carbon stored um, in the soil and with the development that we have at the moment the the weather the climate is warmer more and more we have less rain and uh, that's a big advantage for for different farmers and we have more and more now these scientific results and it's really positive also on the level of industry as example um, an application of ebc um, basic materials um, in the business field of concrete production we have really an innovative company in switzerland they have the first um, fully um, climate neutral or positive uh, concrete uh, production um, it's uh, we also in there in this product we have positive positive impacts of the application of biochar and it's really positive in the second trend that we see then uh, i go to the third point um, as a, a learn as a, a really positive learning that that we have also is that the the companies who buy biochar um, uh, you know, it's it's really uh, uh, various uh, um, companies uh, who who buy biochar, who works with. Uh, they are more and more interested uh, also in having, um, as Harald told us before, this this second part of the value, the the C sync value as part of the product when when they buy uh, this biochar. As example, the concrete producer, uh, he's really interested in in having also the uh, C-Sync potential, and he realized then the C-Sync directly in his product. The same we, we see more and more on the farm level, uh, that uh, farmers are interested in having uh, good or positive carbon footprints. And that's why also they are interested in buying biochar together with the C-Sync potential. Uh, and yeah, some of them, they are <clears throat> open to pay a little bit more for the product, but um, having then everything in one package. That means in the summary, <clears throat> um, if I can maybe make a short summary, we see that the quality of the biochar gets more and more important. We have all the instruments. We will hear then uh, this from Marcel. We have the technology to produce um, high quality biochar. We have the positive uh, effects more and more uh, during application. And at the end, the companies are also interested in having ceasing some of them and uh, all the rest we will hear from Bertha then. 
Yeah, this um, uh, is my short uh, introduction, short presentation, and then I would like to hand over to Berta. Thanks. Um, our next presentation, Berta Meyer, Moya from Come Future. Yeah, I can't seem to uh, start my video. He says the, the host stopped my video. Oh, oh maybe you try now. Maybe Uli has, uh, has still shared. Okay. Not, not, not sure. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Let me find my presentation. Great. Can you see that? Yep. Yes. Perfect. Um, yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, great to great to be here. So I'm Berta. I'm part of the uh, the carbon future oh, sorry, the carbon future team. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to briefly uh, give a brief overview of uh, carbon future and our platform in case you're not familiar with it. And then I will talk about the main challenges and opportunities that we see in the carbon removal sector. Um, so at Carbon Future, we're a, a young company. We've been active uh, in the carbon removal sector for about uh, two years as a marketplace and a fully digital platform uh, for carbon removal credits uh, specifically. Um, so we actually serve the, the whole carbon removal value chain. So from the production uh, of, the, of the carbon sink uh, up until the, uh, the, the sale of the of final sale of the credit. Um, so for this, we've created the, the Carbon Future Platform, so providing both um, the registry and the tracking uh, system and also a, a trading platform. Um, why the tracking? Because, you know, especially with, with biochar, it's essential to, uh, to track uh, the... Um, the, the production of the biochar up until its end use uh, to ensure that the carbon sink is actually created and the biochar is not actually being burned, for instance, right? Um, so yeah, this is why we, we created a fully tracking system. We uh, issue the credits and also have the, the registry. Um, we um, believe that you know, carbon removal should be fully transparent and uh, trustworthy. And that's why our carbon sinks are based only on uh, science-based and um, measurable and persistent uh, carbon removal methods. And that's why, um, for now at least, uh, we're mainly focusing on uh, biochar applications, since it's the, it's the at the moment the only negative emissions technology that can accurately be quantified, certified, and tracked. Um, we also only work with uh, independent verification, so. We don't develop our own methodologies. We leave that to the experts. And then also the verification and registry is done through third parties. So our registry is actually hosted by uh, Carbon Standards International. Um, we also ensure uh, that there's no double counting of the credits, which is another risk uh, for carbon removals and sometimes yeah, uh, happens. And uh, so we have based our system on the uh, blockchain to prevent uh, any data being uh, being changed. Uh, and then also we try to be as transparent as possible by being um, fully digital uh, and provide like seamless tracking uh, from the climate credit uh, up until the, the physical sink. Um, so that's us quickly in a brief overview. Um, and now I'd like to focus more about, um, more focus more on the uh, the development and the challenges that we see in the carbon removal markets. Um, it's definitely a very exciting time to be in the carbon removal ecosystem because it's really uh, a booming sector. Um, there's been a lot of new players popping up, a lot of which actually has allowed like significant uh, investment opportunities for a range of carbon removal projects, which is obviously greatly welcome. Um, it's definitely a very dynamic and uh, the, with that comes the fact that there's many things happening at the same time, different approaching approaches, different pricing strategies, which actually sometimes, uh, unfortunately, can create a bit of a, a blurry image of the industry and 
it creates a bit of confusion or even mistrust in in some cases. So that's something that um, we believe that we need to be very careful about as as an industry. Um, the um, yeah, the the fast growth of the of the market has also um, led to a bit of like price uh, volatility. Um, which sometimes prices have rise to unsustainable levels in, in the long term and can give signals to the market that are not necessarily realistic. Um, I mean, at the moment, um, the, the prices of uh, carbon removal credits are not uh, predictable. And so we need to have more uh, long-term uh, offtake agreements and also long-term pricing to avoid this kind of gold rush uh, approach, so to say, or like a bubble being created in the market, which obviously would be detrimental for, for the whole industry. Um, and again, along with uh, this fast growth and many different players coming up in the market, um, because it's not a regulated market, this means that uh, there's also an increasing number of approaches, methodologies, verification strategies, credit tracking or no tracking, um, which again creates confusion and doesn't give a great image overall uh, for the industry. Uh, so we believe that we need to have like some harmonization to you know, really establish common principles and verification methods to um, yeah, to ensure that we're a trustworthy industry, that we're built on the basis of integrity and, and transparency. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, what we see is like we need a, actually an increase in the supply of uh, carbon removals uh, because the, the demand for the credits is definitely there, but the supply uh, seems to be a bit more the, the bottleneck. And again, to be able to... Um, to significantly scale up projects, we need to have proper standards. So relating to my my previous point, um, and but we also need to have like proper financing in place because that's something that we often um, or always see with our our suppliers, our biochar producers who uh, you know maybe have a pilot scale project and they want to scale up, and the the financing is always the the bottleneck. So I mean we are um, we're trying to. Um, to address this by providing uh, different financing uh, options, either through uh, purchase agreements or uh, different like uh, debt financing options, to yeah to help um, boost the the industry and and achieve the the growth that we uh, that we all want to see. So yeah, uh, thank you. I will pass on to Marcel. Yeah, thanks, Petra. Um... This uh, this last point, uh, increasing supply, is I think a perfect link to to Marcel, because uh, therefore you need uh, you need equipment. So Marcel, tell us how we can uh, increase the supply as we as we are looking forward to increasing the market exponentially. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Pata uh, Uli and Harald for. In doing the, this introduction and to revealing that that we as manufacturers are the bottleneck, uh, it's always good to hear to be the bottleneck. Um, and but but honestly, I think this is a very important uh, thing, and I want to share today um, some of our experiences uh, gained uh, through the last years. I mean, for those who do not uh, know Syncraft, we we are an Austrian-based. Uh, manufacturer of climate positive energy systems. So um, biochar, and I, uh, I regret that, but it's inevitable. Biochar is only our third product. So power and heat, um, our primary, primary products. Um, but since 13 years, we are building these power plants now, these uh, reverse power plants, how we call them. And so we get from the first single plant built in in southern Tyrol or in Italy um, with a 200 kilowatt up to now to a plant uh, having four megawatts on one site, um, which is an industrial production site and it's already in, in commissioning. So half of the plant is already running. So it's in its in its live commissioning phase uh, in Switzerland. Um, so we have one of the smallest plants and the biggest plant in Switzerland. 
Um, and it has been a long road. Uh, and scaling up physical things is not that easy. And it, it's not doing copy paste, especially when you're talking about a new field of technology. And if you compare it to developing a car, it always takes a five years. Uh, so Tesla has not been born by by a year or two. So it's it's some um, growing adult. And, and now after 13 years, we are almost, we call us almost adult or mature. It's, it's, it has been a, a, a constant developing learning um, phase to get a, a system up and run that can uh, operate at, on, a, on a 90% availability a year, uh, which is uh, around 8,000 hours. Um, which has economic advantages. And I think these are the, the biggest thing when it comes to, uh, yeah, we've heard from Berta and Carbon, Carbon Future, when, when the carbon credit market is sold out, you should build more. It's always a big danger that you build things that are not even in the early stage of being mature. And this is, something I, I, I can share on, on our own uh, to build such a big plant that produces 4,000 tons of biochar, the single site. Um, it's not developed overnight. Even if you have unlimited funds, um, you gain experience. And if you imagine we are in our 13th year now uh, of company existence and the oldest plant, commercial plant has only 60,000 hours. That means it's half of its lifetime. Uh, um, so nevertheless, it takes time to develop such things. And, um, I think we have to develop them all together and learn from uh, all together because the market is far too big, but we, we want to share some big sorrow about overheating, yeah? over expectations of growth. We have now the fourth year of a 50%, uh, turnover growth, which is quite challenging and we are not yet at the 70s which or 80s which has been the target values to 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 reach the goals by the ebi um but we doubt that we can continue uh, and i want to share you some some ideas from our side uh, from our side is if if we if we continue the growth at the 50 percent at the moment um, we are building 13 plants at the moment uh, a year and and a single plant produces uh, stores about 1,500 tons of CO2 a year. We have, we will build in 2025, which is not that far away, um, 666 plants. Uh, so so uh, we have accumulated on the market. Uh, it, it's, it's not a small number, um, but um, it's already challenging enough. And if you continue that, um, um, sorry, not 2025, uh, it's 2020, uh, 2030. We have the 666 units in the field, which is roughly one megaton of stored CO2. And to do, to do the, the gigaton level, which some are hoping to be reached soon, it would be 660,000 units um, um, of our premium um, installation. And just to give you an idea, what, what does that mean um, in, in, in size? I want to share you uh, uh, with, with our homepage, um, just to give you an idea. I hope you can see it. I'm not sure. Yes. Yes. Um, we have to, we have to uh, maybe have a look in these different plants, which is the plant in Japan we recently commissioned uh, in 2021. It's a, it's a 1.6 megawatt plant, but to jump to the, to the right size, when we talk about these 660,000 plants, we're talking about uh, this unit size. Um, so it's something not too big, uh, but uh, just to, 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 to think about the right dimension. And, and um, um, Harald already showed it. Our biggest installation now is the bioenergy plant in Frauenfeld, Switzerland. And just to give you an idea of, of the, the dimension, what we have here, is um, at least the the the, the, um, the storing of the of the fuel can't make it bigger now. I don't know why. Um, 
but you see there are two portable cranes um, that only manage the fuel. Uh, so the majority of these plants is covered for fuel logistics. Uh, and, and this is always underestimated if you, if you, if you think about copy pasting uh, such systems that the majority you have to deal with is the biochar logistics and the fuel logistics. The, the rest is more or less the minor part to be dealt with in such installations. So I just, I, I do not want to, to make it uh, too complex and not, not achievable, but we should keep an eye on, on physics. And we should also keep an eye on the systems that are able, uh, Uli also said it, uh, that are able to produce valuable biochar because not everything that is black is a product. Uh, so if you, at least in Europe, if you put in a waste, by law, you get a biochar that is a waste. You can do something against it and you can uh, do a, permitted, a permitting system that you get granted not being a waste, but this is an additional effort you have to do. So you, you can't expect putting in waste and getting out a product. So this is, something that should be considered um, as it is and and uh, is very important. And um, I hope that, that, that especially the, the EBC and CSI will soon and, and others will soon uh, uh, deploy some some system certifications um, that 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 ensure all those booming investments, um, a fair ground um, to have the possibility also to end up with a with a biochar that is able to be uh, granted an EPC certificate, uh, and it's great, great achievement uh, by the by the European Biochar Initiative uh, Industry Consortium and the CSI that they have evolved the EPC 10 to the actual uh, uh, version of uh, number 10, which is now making clear that. Biochar is much more than only for soil. And this is something for the biochar business to get in mature as well, because I think the pure soil application is not, is not the first choice when it comes to economics and not the first choice when it comes to additional, uh, additional effects, because we in Europe, we are blessed with not that bad soils. And the effects of, of the biochar is, is it is good and it's making more resilient, but you're not getting the the big yield growth, uh, uh, additional yield growth um, against uh, very harsh uh, soils in 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 Africa normally. Yeah. So that's that's uh, my contribution to the discussion, and I hope uh, we'll go into details and uh, also into controversial discussion because I think that will bring things further. Thanks. Thanks, Marcel, um, and uh, re-welcome everybody. So if you, if you want everybody, um, you can um, turn on your camera again so we see you um, for the discussion. Uh, thanks, everybody. <clears throat> um, I think there we, we have touched some very interesting points. And uh, just Marcel now, EBC system, end of waste, I think those are, those are issues we might not even be able to, to discuss. Um, but we've heard that we have um, Marcel would need very soon 600,000 plants installed to to be able to, you know, hold up with uh, with our growth we're aiming at. Uh, that means that um, we're not really looking at a competition, um, but rather at, at uh, complementaries. Um, and I've seen, for example, Gerald Dunst um, is or was here. Um, and uh, I know that. Oh, ah, yeah. Hi. <laughs> Um, that he is also um, planning to, to bring a new technology on the market. And there are several uh, companies that are developing something and of some of them, we don't even know yet. They might, they might be coming up and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and I hope this is, uh, this is a global development. Um, so we, we really need you as, uh, as producers and further, uh, future producers um, to, to come and join us in, in, in this effort. Um, I don't know where to start. Maybe um, a, a very important point and to go back to the first presentations is um, the, the carbon markets and this risking 
of a, a bubble because it really is a hype at the moment. Um, uh, I don't know, like a couple of months ago, I was myself uh, saying that Biotron now or like a bit more than a year ago is really taking on speed um, because of the carbon market. So this is an important issue to, to accelerate the whole process because it gives some extra revenue. But now um, I was surprised um, just recently it, um, of, of hearing that the companies that are actually interested or should be interested in gaining uh, lots of revenues through carbon prices, through rising carbon prices, um, are the ones that are telling me we don't want them to rise too drastically because we don't want to create this volatile market. We want some, some steady prices and we want to have something we can calculate with. Um, and, and I think this is a, a very interesting perspective. So from Berta, the risking of a, of a, of a bubble, um, to, um, to the presentation of Uli, um, I would like to ask you um, what implications does this, this trend, um, the bubble, and also companies wanting to buy um, biochar-based carbon credits have on the industry. So from um, Uli's uh, last trend he was presenting uh, that companies are buying um, credits, but at the same time we have the sink creators, the farmers and the construction companies that are, that are actually making those sinks um, that would want to, to use them themselves. And at the same price, there's a there's a, a, a market where the prices might be rising. Will they even be be able to to um, uh, use their own uh, carbon certificates or negative emissions? So that would be an, a question that I would like to have uh, clarified. What's your view on that? And how can we how can we get to a point where it is just so where the the sink producers have uh, the option to to use the sinks they have created for their own um, balance for their own um, em, what compens compensating their emissions or their own carbon footprint and at the same time uh, companies and even individuals that want to improve their climate footprint and do something for the climate in buying those credits they also have um, an option so i would like uh, berta or uli um, uli we yeah. don't see you yet so i would ask maybe berta <laughs> to be ready um maybe yeah, i'll go um i think yes it's very interesting and it's very important to 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 be very clear on like who claims the the climate benefit in in the case of, of biochar um you know who, who has the yeah who, who can claim the the sink value um of the biochar and i think that's that just goes down to the to the tracking and making clear um who is claiming what to again avoid any uh, any double claims or, or double counting? But I think it's um, so long as it's clear on on both ends, it's something that can be um, can be done um, for sure. Good. Then thanks for the question, Harald. Uh, on my side. Um, I'm clearly on the position that uh, I don't see the risk of a bubble at the moment because um, I believe in the self organization also uh, in the market. Um, I um, personally, I started in 1991 as organic farmer. Uh, it, uh, this is the situation then maybe can be a little bit compared with, with biochar at the moment. Everything was new, the prices uh, were really high of these products. And in the meantime, um, we learned that the self-regulation of, of the prices and uh, the production and the consumers, uh, this, this uh, could be handled very well. And, and for, for me, I think the only point that we have to, to look on it is that the usage and the application of the, of the product, of the biochar, goes hand in hand a little bit with the, uh, with the sea sink market uh, in the same time because if as example Zurich or uh, Microsoft buys C-Sync um, values uh, as example um, together with carbon future then in the same time we have to look a little bit that uh, the biochar can be used and applicated somewhere uh, really positive but I don't see it as bubble risk to be honest. Mm -hmm. Okay very interesting also 
And uh, and you, so your opinion would be that if Zurich, for example, wants to compensate emissions, it would be nice to, if I understand it right, uh, to use the char locally also. So they would buy um, actual biochar with the credits and use use the char in urban applications or in construction and and um, use the credits. Well, credits or the the value at least um, that they have certified um, to to balance their emissions. Maybe Berta oh. or I can answer. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. I think I think it can be locally. It must not be locally. Uh, I think a local application. I think we have the the flexibility in here, and and also on the on the market side, we have a little bit of flexibility if maybe. Uh, a company wants to pay more for for really this sustainable sea sink then yeah let's let's pay them and <laughs> uh, let's see how the market uh, will will develop yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> Masa, before we go to the questions because i haven't uh, looked into the chat maybe christian you can you can help us out later and and yeah um may may i add two things um i think that it's very important that we that we think that we produce biochar for certain applications by intention um, so a biochar produced that could become everything is never ever the best for its certain application. Yeah? So producing feature is making feature yeah? because then you have all the GMP plus issues and so on. And you have to write understanding of this feature production. If you make a, a material that should end up in a, in a, in a construction material like concrete, you have totally different uh, topics uh, to fulfill. Yeah? So this is something I would really Ask because it it also interferes with the with the sink issue afterwards, huh? because the sink players or the sink consumers uh, or the granted ones are different, huh? different industries, different applications, and biochar is 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 uh, versatile, huh? but 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 you a good construction material might not be a good feature, yeah? and vice versa. So also the production has to grow mature by intention for a certain application. And then it should be really not overheated. Eh? So I'm, I'm, I'm also with, uh, with Berta and, and Carbon Future. Uh, it, this over I, I don't like over-regulated market as well, but, but selling a carbon credit CO2 for more than 500 euros per ton, for me, that becomes ridiculous, even if it's a great, bargain no doubt but that's getting insane yeah? and and um that really would 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 cause the effect of biochar carbon credits are not affordable on the long run yeah? and that would be the biggest threat to the market yeah? if if biochar gets too 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 expensive for for being a carbon sink too expensive for application then it's done. Yeah. Then we get a big, a big decline in demand, and I think good prices are very reasonable. But but I see a big threat in overheating. Um, mm. I've yeah, heard, I think. Yeah, sorry, I've heard that a couple of times already. That that biochar, um, while the, the the carbon markets are are becoming more important, it is very. It's at least equally or more important to to stress that biochar as a product has its value, and I think that's exactly that. That you have certain use cases, and of course you have different prices, and it can it can be the case, and it will be normally. And I think that's that's what we're seeing at the moment. That those carbon credits can help, uh, well, as a type of subsidy for biochar applications. But the, still, the product has to, to be a valuable product and stay that. And uh, it should not be produced for the credits. And then we do whatever with it. Um, so the, the main focus, it would be nice to have it on the product. But the solutions uh, still have to be defined. I mean, yeah, please, Beth. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I was going to say, like, adding on to that, I think with the, the very high um, 
credit prices, it kind of sending a signal to um, to the market or even like to biochar producers to think like, oh, I can get yeah, like three, four, five hundred euros per ton, um, which is unrealistic in in the long term. And then I think the risk there, because um, we also see a lot of biochar producers who um, who base a lot of their business model on the on the carbon sink revenues, right? Um, which is yeah, it, it's fine. But then if you need to base that on on realistic prices in in the long term, and I think these very high prices. They're a bit like what Uli is saying, like, you know, maybe they're like very high at the moment, but then it will regulate and I think probably more to like the, the lower end. And so I think there's a risk of, um, yeah, I think we need to focus on the the, bio, the value of the biochar itself and then the credits are a plus, um, ideally. Um, yeah. Yes, thanks. Christian, do you want to ask a couple of questions from the audience as we don't have so much time left? Um, yeah, so I had a quick question. So we are talking a lot about the private biochar market. Um, if we look at the 2030 goals of whole countries and also the inter inclusion of biochar and other net uh, technologies, does anyone see any point in the public getting invested in this area? So what happens if a municipality just says, okay, we, we built a couple of plants, um, what happens with the market then if they just build it and give it out for free, for example? Is that positive or negative? It would be an interesting business case to give it out for free. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, um, I mean, countries are now paying, Austria, for example, is paying billions for um, emission certificates. There, there is a certain price for CO2 already that is quite high. And we know this price. So where's the combine of the balance between this public and private price? I'm I'm wondering. I, just uh, if if I want if nobody's there, please raise your hand if you want to say something. Um, so I don't interrupt you and don't take too much time. Uh, but at the moment, it's a discussion on an EU level, and we're of course involved because we are the industry representatives um, of the CRCM, uh, the Carbon Removal Crediting Mechanism. Um, and, and this is not only about, it is also about voluntary markets, but it's also about inclusion of negative emission technologies into the a carbon trading system of the EU. So we don't know where it will end up. And actually it's, um, for me, it, it's, it's not so important in which, in which uh, system it will enter. There are different things that are important, like the, the strict separation of emission reduction and the creation of carbon sinks. But we are positioning um, uh, biochar as a technical carbon removal. And um, there are different options, like uh, it can go into the effort sharing mechanism or in the ETS, um, emissions trading system. Um, so just given a few basic principles, I'm, well, uh, neutral in, in which area should fit, but I think there will be claims of the public um, of getting those credits, and not as not necessarily like um, it's done with the forest at the moment, but certainly this issue is, is an important one. So maybe somebody would, would like to answer actually Christian's uh, question as I haven't done that. <laughs> Paul is raising his hand and Willie wants to say something. No, I just wanted to continue the question on um, my, my perspective is we are looking at biochar in the market in Belgium, which there's not a lot of biochar markets. Um, so for us as starters, it's interesting for the price to, of course, be high. We, of course, know the price should decrease over time. Um, but I wonder what that will have as an effect on private prof or the profitability of private installations, um, because the if the prices of biochar decrease and the prices of carbon credits maybe decrease or stabilize, it will have an effect on, on, on profitability of such installations and maybe they become less attractive for people developing such installations. If, yeah. if, you, are, if you allow, maybe, maybe first a comment on um, the question of, uh, of Christian. Um, we are in contact with, with different governmental institutions um, in Europe, also with the municipalities or cities 
um, and all of them, it's only an information in general, all of them, they start with the, with business plans. Uh, I, I have no I have no information that uh, one of these governmental institutions are planning an installation for producing biochar and giving them the biochar for free. It's more a general comment. All of them, they calculate a little bit and um, yeah, let's see how, where, it, where it will go. But it's not my expectation that we will have biochar for free uh, in the next years on the market. Yeah, I would also see that as it's still it's a, it's a product that's um, that is very interesting on the market. So the demand is just too high still. And as we've seen, uh, as Marcel uh, showed us, uh, it, it is not so easy to scale up that rapidly. So it, this might stay the case. Marcel, do you want to say to comment? Yeah, I, th I just want to flank with really said, I think even even in our case where energy is, is covering most of the expenses um, and the stress is low on the biochar, you won't get any biochar for free from the plant in Fraunfeld already, already from the startup. And I think uh, that also answers some part of the question. I think I've heard from Paul that the key is that the that this is also an energy system. Nevertheless, whether you do a pyrolysis or, or a, a system like ours, if you don't utilize the excess heat or energy, I think you are outbalanced. And if you build it on a waste reduction unit, uh, it's a different application that if you do biochar production and heat utilization by intention. So it's, it's how you set up your business case. And, and if we won't end up like a lot of biogas plants in Germany that you do not use the heat uh, and uh, on, only run by incentives, it's, it's, it's not, it's not going to be sustainable. So you have to use in some cool way, like for example, Gerald is doing with his new setup. Um, you have to utilize the heat uh, in a good way. And then you have less stress on your biochar and less stress on your carbon credits, but it still makes fun. Yeah? And this is the key. So don't only emphasize on the credit. You have the product, you have the energy and you have the credit and then it's uh, a round system. Yeah? It's true. Uh, Paul, do you, do you have a follow-up comment on that? No, it's uh, still um, raised. Um, so then uh, we have a question from the audience from Matthew Myers um, about the off-takers of biochar so far. So can you uh, tell us who is actually buying biochar right now? So who are the typical customers, for, especially in the agricultural sector? Who wants to go? Maybe Bert. Hmm? Maybe you uh, know. I, I could answer it. No, the, <laughs> I think it's good, yeah. the, the most important customers uh, for us are farmers who use feed char mm. because this is the most economical way to create healthy animals. Uh, and the second uh, biggest amount goes into the city for the new tree planting systems, the Stockholm system. These are the big markets at the moment, and this two markets are the reason why we are sold out in, in Europe. Uh, the home gardener uh, area is a very small uh, business. Uh, you can package it in, in small bags, like 20 liters, and sell it back per bag, but it's a very hard business. <laughs> so big amounts go into, into the cities to planting trees. Mm. Um, what I heard also is uh, special cultures like wine, for example, a couple of fruits, uh, which are rather interesting for some uh, large vendors. The, the, the trees, interestingly, Gerald, if it's for you, um, uh, I, we are just still hoping. It depends who you ask. Some are already selling to, to, this, uh, to this model. Um, but some are still waiting for, for the market to develop. So this is one of our focus areas now to, to make this Stockholm model and everything associated with it a lot bigger because it's just uh, the, the results uh, we've seen, they're just genius. It's just great. 
In Austria, it's really the most popular way to plant trees in the cities. Nearly every town tried at the moment, and wow. every every place is very successful. Very nice. Um, maybe a follow-up question on the cement um, topic, so biotrain concrete or cement. Um, so, do you think uh, this this will be solved on or sold on a market base, or is it a direct um, producer customer? relationship so will they will that come on the market or is it just we build a plant and we use the biotech that's the thing um I, i think i would say and i think marcel is, is even more involved in that but the integration of production uh, units in an existing uh, um, company or industry that's a, that's a very important uh, very interesting uh, way of looking at it like really closing cycles if you have residues that you can use you need heat that you have to produce um, for the production of cement for example and you can install um, a production unit on site maybe using waste wood or so um, from a neighbor and use the the energy that's produced and the and the char um, i think this is the way to to go isn't it Yeah, definitely. Integration is, is a cool thing. And, and as all the biochar is almost sold out, you have to get your own source. Yeah? Even if you, especially if you need big amounts. So if you talk about the cement or the, the, the concrete industry, you have to talk about multiple thousand tons a year at a single site. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's just uh, too small. Yeah? And, and maybe I add there a very important thing and all for those who think to get rid of waste char in the concrete. Uh, um, it's not getting rid of something because even if it's the biggest market, it demands a totally homogeneous, expectable, defined product that for sure has reached in Europe. Uh, so don't think about putting into thing, anything into concrete without a reach certificate. That's a mission impossible, especially in the legal way. But, but do not underestimate the demand for, for a climate additive in concrete. And what I really, I really want to emphasize as well is that it has to bring a value, an added value. So it's not about putting biochar into a, a concrete to, to, to make it more green. Uh, because it's not affordable. Uh, it's far too expensive. Concrete is a mass product, very cheap per ton. Uh, so if you add certain amounts, it rises your price to unlimited uh, or impossible uh, dimensions. So, so it really depends. You have to have bring an added value uh, to the concrete. And that's, uh, I don't think that actually is here, uh, but, but you, in our efforts, we replaced cement. Uh, up to 15% and get a pre better pressure values on the, on, the, on, on the concrete. So we do not have to take it too easy and say we can make a green concrete by putting in some biochar. Uh, you, have to, you have to amend the biochar. You have to treat it to make a very homogeneous additive that is on industrial scale applied to this big industry. Otherwise, they, they would just throw us out. And... And there are not so much first first uh, steps possible. Huh? So, if if there are two or three bad rumors, um, it will become even more problematic for the for the for the ones to follow. So this is this is not the dumb place for for low quality biochar. Huh? This this is very dangerous. Yep. Thanks. Um, and I think this is something that. Um, Well, we hear um, rather frequently, Christian, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, because you're at the source, that um, the use of biochar in products, whatever product it is, should be aiming at the improvement of qualities of those products. And I think generally it also is, also in high-tech materials and everything. It's not, not a dump site for carbon. Um, and in this case, you could, you could just leave it out of the concrete and dump it anywhere else um, and, and, and just buy the credits, right? So what we have is we need to, to substitute uh, fossil resources 
um, through biogenic carbon. And, and uh, apparently people and companies are finding very interesting uh, ways of doing that and improving the qualities of a product to have a superior product, which again, you can sell maybe for a higher price with a better carbon footprint. You have more questions? Oh. I mean, I, I have indefinite questions, uh, but um, I'm not sure how long um, all the mm -hmm. participants can stay. So I'm just saying that we have five minutes over time. So um, officially, I think it's already over. <laughs> um, so I don't know how hard you can decide or everyone for him or herself, if you want to continue. For me, a couple of minutes is all right. Um, some of us are on vacation, I think. <laughs> so it's rather on the others. Yeah, I'm happy to stay another couple of minutes as well. Yeah, for me, it's fine too. Um, because I, I had one, one, one more question uh, regarding the bubble and the risks that this big growth or, and, and this high prices bring with it. So um, as Marcel just said, if, if you have one or two, maybe three uh, possibilities to come into an industry uh, before they will shut you out for the next 10 years, um, do you see this problem also with other markets um, other than cement um, with Biotra at the moment? Because we will have hundreds of producers now. Um, we know from Paris's units, especially from uh, East Asia, that, that are far off any emission uh, regulation um, and also biochar and, and carbon materials coming in. Um, do you see these risks and how can the industry actually try to avoid um, getting swamped by these producers? Yeah, maybe, maybe Harald, Harald, if you allow, um, I think it's it's really our job now to, to work a little bit um, and as good as possible all over the world in the different countries. And that's what we what we want to do and what we are doing at the moment also as Carbon Standards International. We we speak with, with many different and new producers and we try to explain them um, as important it is to, to produce a proper biochar, Uh, to have a uh, good seizing potential calculated behind at the end. And uh, we have to integrate many new things and we really have to do a big job in the next years that, uh, yeah, at the end we have a good product in the market and biochar still has a good, a good image. And it's a little bit one of my worries that I have um, at the moment. Um, this is more and more uh, people uh, start to speak about biochar more and more also farmers uh, think to use uh, biochar uh, on, on their farms and we will need the quantities we will need to scale up and to do that in a, in a proper way and in a good quality it's um, it's hard job to do but we have to do it so certification, let's say, is, is key uh, to securing uh, the whole biochar industry. This is what I would say. I don't think any, anyone opines, um, opposes. And uh, because there are, and we know that there are production facilities uh, that produce either just biochar, but not a, not a high grade or energy, actually, and a residue is something black. And this something black can be highly contaminated. Um, but it is there, and if it's on the farm already, it, it's likely to be used in, you know, on the farm, because then you don't have to get rid of it. And if you hear that biochar is good, so this communication still um, has to be to be pushed further. And, and um, I think that's it's it's on us to communicate what biochar is. That if we're talking about it, it is. Um, some something like EBC grade. I, I don't. I don't want to stress that EBC is the only, but it has to um, adhere to a certain standard. Um, and and this is if if it doesn't, we don't talk about biochar, and it's just a totally different product. It might look alike, but it's not. It's not the same. Um, I think this is this is very important to stress on, because if not, we can really risk. And um, we had a couple of. Uh, of um, issues in Germany and in, in uh, other European countries where something that was not biochar per our definition was used in agriculture. Um, and it, it didn't really 
get to a very big scandal, but as uh, as biochar is, is getting bigger now, those things can really risk to 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 damage the industry drastically. Does anyone have thoughts? I mean, farmers typically, uh, conventional farmers, they value things on NPK. So, in terms of uh, biochar and how it's modeled uh, by a, a conventional farmer and the, the economic value in, in, in say year one, year two, year three, is there a model that, that uh, sort of speaks farmer language for that? Well, in, in biochar itself, you don't really have, you don't really find so much NPK depending on the, of course, depending on the input materials you're using. Um, if if you want to address this, uh, you you would look at the use of NPK fertilizers compared to uh, sole use of NPK fertilizers, um, and the use of fertilizers blended or, or into biochar mm -hmm. or incorporated into biochar, and then you can drastically reduce uh, the use of uh, of NPK fertilization. And drastically, I mean, really, like. You, you can feel it. The thing is that uh, it depends on the fertilizer prices. As I see it now, fertilizer prices are rising and biochar prices tend to what drop. I, what I mean is whether it's a software or an Excel sheet, if a, if a farmer could predict that they're going to use less NPK over time from uh, biochar or, or compost, you know, then, then it's, it's easier for them to model it. Otherwise, it, it is good in, in a scientific paper, but it's not something they're going to use in, in practice. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I can give an answer. We work together with around 400 farmers, but nobody, nearly nobody of these farmers is willing to use biochar at the moment because it's too expensive to spray it directly on the field together or without uh, different nutrients. So at the moment, the farmers can only use it for uh, an uh, or put it into the slurry to reduce the smell of it, uh, but not for uh, hold back nitrogen. Mm -hmm. It's too expensive at the moment. And this, for, for me, this is the most important point. Biochar is too expensive to bring it to the farmers. And this is the reason why we need these uh, CO2 certificates to make it cheaper. Yeah, and, and Matt, I don't know any Excel sheet um, including such a calculation. Uh, we are working really close with farmers and it's, it's not existent. Yeah. Yep, that might be coming up um, as soon as we have fertilizer producers getting more into the topic and selling products based on biochar and certain type of uh, fertilizers, I guess, then they will elaborate that also. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Christian. I hope you can understand me. I'm outside. Uh, my question would be, um, I'm a consultant and I have a customer who is planning a pea shell uh, facility and they want to shell 15,000 tons a year. This would be a amount uh, where I was uh, questioning if the biochar uh, industry or the pyrolysis uh, Producers are able to um, bring um, yeah facilities to the market that are able to pluralize uh, fifteen thousand tons. Thank you. Who wants to go? I think fifteen thousand tons is already feasible. It, it's not so much. It's, it's possible with our facility. Okay, so. and. Um, which uh, producer would you prefer or which uh, one is uh, able to do so? Because I've seen uh, quite a list uh, at the beginning of the talk. Um, is everybody able or would you say, okay, Purek, we know uh, is a high standard. What is about uh, other producers? Well, Gerard uh, would I mean, certainly <laughs> have I a mean, recommendation. <laughs> that's a hard job now, but, but what, what I really want to stress is whether you have such a big plant already done and operated for several years, or if you plan to do, or you have in mind to do, because I would say these amounts are not that easy to handle. Yeah? 
That's in, my in real world. as well. In real world. Uh, um, so this is... Yeah. yeah. We will do it. Uh, it is a, it is a planned... It is a planned... Uh, not a, it is not a plant that is uh, already in existence. It is a planned uh, facility. So they are just thinking about uh, to do this. So it would be interesting to uh, go into more networking activities to get a bit support for this type of project because it is a little bit maybe um, important to choose the right partner. So I would recommend you just uh, just write me an email. It's my first and last name at biochar-industry.com, and I can I can put you in contact with uh, several manufacturers, and then you can you know give you an overview. This mm -hmm. is what I can do, and then you can talk to several of them and and make up your own uh, opinion. Okay. Which one would be suitable? Yeah. Um, thank you. I think at this point we we will come to an end now. Um, so uh, just the last uh, question to the participants, if you want to answer, obviously. Um, what is the one thing you want to see in five years from now that is on the market regarding biochar? Interesting. Uh, well, should I start or what? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so five years. Um, well, my my... What I would love to see is a, a circular economy based on biochar-based materials, so that we that we create uh, what we are now creating from plastics and with biochar-based composites, recycle them through pyrolysis, add some new binders to them, and and get back into another product. So we have we would have a constantly increasing carbon pool just by the stuff we consume like i have so much around me which is really doing harm to the environment if that could be um, biochar based with natural binders um, our consumption could be something good instead of something less bad um, that would be my my hope i don't know if it's realizable in the next uh, five years maybe ten uh thanks uh, Beate? um yeah, I think for me as well, uh, yeah, seeing biochar, um, I think in the next five years it would be great if like everyone I tell that I work with biochar knows what it's what it is. <laughs> I think that would be a great achievement. And uh, and yeah, and just seeing biochar being used um, more more widely in, in all its different types of applications and all um yeah, all organic matter that is now being burnt, at least being transformed into into biochar and, and used. You, um, Marcelo, yeah, then I would like to add that um, I hope that in five years people um, understand the second thing is uh, let's work on it that this product will be um, also on the price level, on the, on the right price level that um, the product should have and that at the end new product pro users are able to install facilities machines and um, to be pr profitable with that's uh, that's what i hope thank you it interrupted for me i hope i'm i'm the only one seems to be um Marcel, your take on that um a lot of different versatile mature systems available that that the join forces in this incredible big task of stabilizing climate with biochar so honestly i see there's no competition in technology just in the whole the whole thing to be done together that's 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 the only thing that matters, uh, and and not overheating on, on the way towards it. Uh. That's my only hope. Cooperation, great. <laughs> I think those are some nice uh, final words, isn't it, Christian? Yes, thank you for that. Um, so thanks all the presenters now. Um, thanks for trying, uh, staying so late.
today. Uh, and thanks for your insights from an industry perspective that's something different than we us used to here. 